Some people are born great, like kings and queens, dukes, nobles, lords, ladies, and those on that scene. Others achieve greatness. They stand out of line, not one of the crowd, they're ahead of their time. They're called the history makers. They reached another plane on which conventions crack and break and customs take the strain. It stretches near and far and wide, but never out of range. But it only holds those people who saw a need for a change. We come now to the ordinary folk, the friend, the neighbour or the damn good bloke, often referred to as the common man. Usually those who use their hands to toil and sweat in the labouring classes, lost in time in the general masses, who feel no glitter in their lives, they're the boys and the girls and the husbands and the wives who pace themselves through a routine day, in a routine job for a routine pay, in a tick-tock clockwork mechanical way, wishing they could all exchange their way of life and rearrange and put it right. They only dream of change. It gets them through the night. It makes me smile when I hear your dreams of being a star on the movie screen or a playboy servicing the bunny girls or a superman in the athlete world or a cosmonaut in the galactic zone or a millionaire in a stately home or the mastermind of some military manoeuvre or an artist with paintings that bankrupt that louvre or a scientist pushing back the frontiers of knowledge or a leading academic in an Oxford college or the author of a best-selling paperback or a handsome superstar who plays the sax. The very thought seems to drive you wild. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The toys, the noise, the slides and the swings and the roundabouts. I turned to see a separate reality and I watched my childhood blow up. Why don't adults grow up? going out with me. Huh? I'm going out with you. God, you're so damn self-opinionated. <laughs> OK, <laughs> we're going out with each other. Does that sound better? It's a possessive term, typical of an insecure, male chauvinist pig. Mm, you've changed. Yeah, you bet I've changed. 
and I'm not taking any more of your crap. Listen, I'm an individual with a life of my own that doesn't revolve around you as you think it should. My God, <coughs> what are they teaching you at these meetings? Self-fulfillment. Yeah? Yeah. You're so conditioned. You want me to conform to your ideas of what a relationship is all about. Well, let me tell you something. I have a personality all of my own, and I don't need to inherit all your hang-ups and inadequacies, thank you. You make it sound as though we've never had any land. Look, things are changing. I'm breaking down my background conditioning, OK? I'm releasing myself of the bondage of the female social role. I'm developing. And I'm getting a whole different impression of you. Understand? Look, you're supposed to be, you know, going out with me. Where does the heart fit in? <gasps> Look, your problem is, is that you're just a romantic fool. Like, do you ever stop and examine your own psychology? Like, you know, spending enough time telling everybody else where their thinking's gone wrong. Do you ever consider your own? Oh, I'm taking up yoga. Dreamer, big ideas, man. You're all bloody talk. Look, I'm a man. <laughs> I face different problems to you. Uh -huh. I'm trying to break. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You once told me it was a man's world. Yeah, yeah, but unlike women, I don't hold it to ransom. Look, this world's been run by men for long enough. Men are pig-headed. Stubborn, aggressive animals, so hyped up man on their macho image. Just look at the mess that man has made. And women could do better. Look, women are tender animals. We give birth. We're about giving life, not taking it away. This destructive instinct that man possesses. May have been useful in the Stone Age, chasing the saber-toothed tigers away. But there's just no reason for it now. And aggression should become obsolete. Yeah, but what about Maggie Thatcher? She's a woman playing a man's role. Oh, OK, so you've got all the answers. But where do I fit in? <coughs> you don't. So this is the Casablanca scene? Yeah, and you've got the plane to catch. Girls, girls! Wife is a chore, a fiance is a passenger, a lady is a bore. A dear is too expensive, a darling is an embarrassment, a heartthrob will give you a hemorrhage and only increase your harassment. A goddess is an illusion, a mistress is a summon, a fancy piece is an ego trip and just another woman. A date is a line in a diary, a conquest will be your ruin, and intended is what you mean to do, but never get round to doing. A whore will sell you short, a tart will leave you a bad taste, a pro will con you for a ride, an escort's always by your side, but she shows you to your place. A bitch will suck you all night long and spit it in your face. A nanny will give you a lecture, a lover will keep you lean, a wife is a business partner who makes sure the sheets are clean. And you get just what you ask for, you get what you deserve, 
You get a good performance, but one that's got no heart, just nerve. The destruction of the natural is a formula for freaks, and modern women only play these parts because modern man is weak. Oh, there you are. Your dinner's in the oven. It's probably all dried up by now. Hey, Arthur. I'll mention to Mrs. Stinkbank this morning. I've seen no end of car parts outside that woman's house. Oh, it's shameful. You know, she's a nice girl. I bumped into her in Tesco the other week. You remember that day we had the trouble getting your mother out of Mr. Harvey's mini? <coughs> hey, laddie. Have a look at tonight's paper. Watson's are advertising for a draft excluder. Yeah, but I don't want to be a draft. Uh, none of your excuses, my lad. While you're in this house, you pull your weight. I don't want you loafing about all day. It's bad enough with him, I can tell you. But I was telling you, went to Edna's this morning, and what should I see but a green car pulling up outside that woman's house? And who should get out? But that Mr. Orson, <laughs> I ask you, you know he's a nice chap, he's too short to support. It's shameful, it really is. You know Lawson, do you? Live on um, Grime Street next to Bells, you know them with that awful smelly dog. <laughs> hey, look, I didn't buy that paper for you to sit and laugh at the joke. Look for a job, lad. <laughs> On my way back from Edna's, I see that Mr. Lawson being shown to the door by that woman. He was putting on his coat, readjusting his tie. <laughs> <laughs> I know what's going on, I ask her, you know. She's a nice lass, but she'll never get anybody to respect her. I tell you, I don't know what she thinks she's doing. She's an acupuncturist. Is that what they call them these days? No, no. <laughs> It's one of their new kind of treatments. Well, it's not that new. It's for rheumatism. You want to pop along, it'll do you some good. <laughs> I'm not going to that woman and have my good name talked about in this neighbourhood. You must be joking. <laughs> Dr Gibson does me just fine. Gives me all the Valium I need. <laughs> have you found anything then? Nah, nothing here for superheroes. <laughs> you should take what you can get and be thankful, lad. Oh, for how we managed to raise such a man out so look at him. You know, you don't get it from your father or me. <laughs> We've struggled and scraped to get where we are today. It's through no fault of his your father lost his job. You know, a man of his age doesn't stand a chance of getting a job, but you do, lad, you do. He, you know, after his couldn't care less attitude does annoy me. I could felt him up backside, I could honestly. If you put as much effort into getting a job as you did into playing that trumpet thing you've been managing director of ICIB now. It's a saxophone. Oh, what a nuisance. I'm telling you, lad, you have to pay your way in this life. Yeah, but the answer's in art. <laughs> don't give me that. I bet the trouble with the youth of today is they don't want to work. He needs a good kick up backside. I've always said it. A spell in the army and do you well, the good lad, you know, if they'd kick some discipline into you. Oh, I don't know where Will's going to, I really don't. Yeah, where are we going? Where have we been? Yeah, where? Arthur, remind me to get that all finished all that that Lawson brought us back from the Dutch and the Dutch and the Dutch and the Like a sip, taste, love wine. I know now the time is not on my side, not this time. Heavens, believe me. Oh, don't you deceive me Believe me, believe me, believe me Believe me this time Get me this day, my daily bread For I'm losing my 
my mind and about my head. Oh beautiful world. Oh beautiful world. Mother, my father, they call me son. But I'm questioning where I come from. But their world is not mine, cause what is is not mine to give to you. Time slipping away, slipping away from day to day. <laughs> So this is what you wanted. So this is what you've worked for. Well, this is what you've got. Wash the plates, wipe the tray, wash the saucers, pack away, clean the sideboard, dust the chairs, hoover the carpet, polish the stairs, sort out the papers, sort out the cloaks, cut out the capers, cut out the jokes, boil the kettle another sup, then tidy up the dirty cups and scrub the floors. Pat your husband on the head and kiss his cheek. It's all part of the chores. And why do you do it? Because I love my family and I love my husband, of course. She's Mrs. Happy Housewife, 83. And probably 84. The things we do in the name of love are best described as war. Anyway, Arthur, I said to Dr. Gibson, I said, look, you've got to give me something for my back. Arthur. My name's Rob Selma. Boy, am I pleased to meet you. Don't take a seat. Hi, folks. I'll just come around to tell you about the new household home of tomorrow that is here today. Gone are the days of drudgery and domestic chores. No, not anymore. Allow me to introduce you to Roderick. Good evening, everybody. My name's Roderick the Robot, and uh, <laughs> could only be too willing to please. Here, yeah, we're not talking about Judas in here. I've been Mr. Prosser. Come and have a look if you don't mind. At Chuck, you're an honourable member of the General Engineering and Allied Washermakers Union, so treat me with respect. No disrespect in Terry, I assure you, Comrade Joe. I was merely going to illuminate the benefits of technology to help you develop into an omniscient being capable of experiencing the union with a God concept to reach out to the furthest perimeters of your potential to find self-fulfillment. That was all I was trying to tell you. Eve, will he do ironing? Uh -huh, no, no. Should be an honor. Here, yeah, hang on a moment. That sack of silicon put me out of a job. <laughs> 40 years of my life I gave to industry. 3,855,972 hours and 30 minutes of tedium. 58% of my conscious time digging for Britain. <laughs> 58%. And what's happened? Aye, right. salesman of industry. Come salesman of technology. Rage all the bloody fun. I'm now obsolete. People tap the grass. I didn't know they were so long. Anyway, I must have asked myself. <coughs> well, I'm ordered. Thank you. All right. Before anything else happens, I'd like to say, Mappy, what about our job? A man has the right to an honest day's work, not for such an honest day's payment. Nevertheless, it's British tradition to have full employment, not to mention pride and dignity of members, which have to be considered. But Comrade Brooke, how can you argue with an alternative that can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 50 weeks a year, allowing two weeks of service, never stops for a cup of tea, never heard of washing up time, and to top it all, it doesn't go on strike, do you see? Ah, but I bet it don't tell jokes. Hey, Rod, baby, tell him that really bad joke. Certainly. What did the robot say to the silly shop steward? I don't know. What did the robot say to the shop steward? Ha <laughs> ha, all out. Ha <laughs> ha. That's bloody funny. This is social revolution. We should be talking about it. You tell him, boy. So, Dad, you can forget about the work ethic. Work ethic, lad? What work ethic? The work ethic's the reason you've been getting out of bed for the last 40 years. You get up so early because you've got so much to do. You go to bed so early because you've got nothing to think about. The work ethic promised to a better standard of living, 
but has it paid off? Yeah, you baffled me, lad. You baffled me. Just baffled. baffled, that's exactly how they want you to be. Baffled, baffled, baffled. On this side of the imaginary door, you can stand apart, involved no more. You can look at your situation in a cold, clear light. Analyse, break down, criticise, put the world to right. Formulate, project and perpetuate all that seems so real. When you're on the outside, you simply do not feel. It's easy. Through there in the race, destruction drains your stamina and disturbs the calm and your pulse rate responds to the race. You throw up your arms and jostle for a place, but it's a false alarm because you have no chance of winning and no peace of mind. Because you're running out of breath and you're running out of time and you're running round in circles and you're running and you're running and you're running and you're running. And you're running. On this side of the imaginary door, there's much you can learn. Let's face it, you can't find what you need. You don't know which way to turn amidst discarded props and yesterday's leads. Everything stops. Your position and place is defined in the mess. Your growth has been stunted by enforced distress. Everywhere you look, false dangers mar the scene and dominate the view. The truth is a stranger deep within you. And you dance the dance and you toe the line because that's the price you pay for society's free mind. Your thoughts have been manipulated and abused. Your safety feels threatened and attacked. You feel confused. Your confidence is cracked. It's no use looking for help from those with power, position, wealth, status and social standing. They're doing fine. To them you are just a line on a piece of paper, just a name on a mailing list, 
Just another one on the records, just a mark on a floppy disk, just a hole in a computer card, just a digit, just a print, just a figure, not a person, not a mention, not a hint. That you just make up the numbers, just another one in hand, just another pawn in the game, just another grain of sand. You're just another one that's caught, just another one entangled and writhing in a mess, just another that's easy meat, just bones and blood and flesh. Just one of 4,000 million that are just hovering on the brink. You're just another dying mammal that's just about to become extinct. If you could just see, and see you must, you just one chance, but only just. He doesn't see, he's still perplexed. I wonder where he'll turn to next.